Okay, so good morning everyone and good afternoon for those uh, watching us online in, uh, in Europe and welcome to Miami. Uh, today is Millicom's 2014 Capital Market Day. Uh, I'm Nicolas Didio, Head of Investor Relations. Uh, I would like to remind you uh, the safe harbor statements uh, apply to these presentations and the subsequent Q&A. Uh, let's uh, have a look on the agenda today. Uh, we will start with uh, uh, opening uh, remarks and strategic update by Ansel Albrecht, our president and CEO, followed by a, a LATAM session with um, Mario Zanotti, uh, senior EVP uh, of operations, and Martin Levitz, uh, EVP of cable and digital media, followed by a, a Q&A. Then we will uh, move to Colombia uh, with Esteban Ayarte, general manager, followed after the lunch break by Africa and a presentation by Arthur Bastings, EVP of Africa. We will uh, go after uh, Africa. Uh, we will uh, organize a digital lifestyle panel where we will have uh, four, um, uh, four managers on stage and uh, discussing with Ansorger and discussing with you in the room. And we will finish the day with a presentation by Tim Pennington, Group CFO, and concluding remarks by uh, Ansorger. So uh, I invite Ansorger to join me on stage. Thank you. Didier, and um, welcome everyone to our Capital Markets Day here in Miami. We choose Miami for several reasons. One is uh, obviously that we're going to talk today a lot about uh, South America and the transformation when it comes to our digital lifestyle strategy, as well as uh, Colombia. It doesn't mean that we don't like Africa anymore. We're going to talk about Africa as well, obviously, but uh, that's the kind of key focus we have um, today. The other point, obviously, is uh, Miami is the, the, the headquarter for us when it comes to Latin America. We have a lot of people working here and uh, fulfilling the things we are planning. And last but not least, it's a, it's a good place to come, I guess, particularly for our shareholders from Sweden, where it's getting dark already and colder. So Miami at this time of the year is not too bad. It's now my second Capital Markets Day. 18 months ago, I uh, was the first time presenting to you what we want to do with uh, Millicom. And a lot have happened, and we're going to talk during the day about all the things which have changed. But just to give you a glimpse of all the activities, I'll show you a little movie to start with. You can see it has been very busy, one and a half years or two years for the company, a lot of new products, and um, a lot of things happened at the same time. I think the most important point, I'm going to come back to this uh, during my presentation, is obviously we came up with a new strategy, a new vision for the company going forward into the next coming years. We launched a lot of new products, um, some of them you're going to see in the back, so I encourage you during the breaks, go to each of those kind of uh, places and talk to the people who run the business so you can see what they're doing, how they're doing things. We change the organization. We have a complete new management team. We have new people in the organization. We have new people, talents. We had to hire a lot of new people in order to do the transformation from voice to data, uh, from uh, data to the digital lifestyle. And um, I wouldn't say we have a new culture, but we reinforced the old culture which has made uh, this company and the, the whole steam sphere very strong, which is very entrepreneurial fast-moving, risk-taking, and uh, move forward. So I think this is the kind of um, situation we, we are in today. And I think it's good to, to look a bit back in, um, in where did we start 18 months ago, because as Churchill said, you have to, or in order to understand the future, you have to understand your history. It shows you a bit what, has, what was the situation 18 months ago, what have we achieved as a company. And the situation at that time was complicated. It was a, a kind of fundamental change in the, um, the business. We saw that our business voice, which was 80-90% of the revenues, was uh, declining fast. We saw internal problems that our subscriber growth was uh, decelerating. We had heavy competition when it comes to price and APU in uh, all of our markets. And hence, we saw uh, a kind of sharp decline when it comes to the revenue growth in the company. So it was, as we always say, it was a turnaround situation because it went deeper than those figures, which you don't see normally and we don't talk that often, but it goes into the questions like brand perception, it goes into those questions like network quality in some of the markets, it goes in the kind of question like uh, what kind of talents we have in order to, um, to run the business. So it was very obvious for me and the team at that time, we need, we need to do a turnaround, we need to change the company quite fundamentally, and we need a kind of new vision and a new strategy. And the fundamental idea we has had at this time was that we have to move out from the traditional telco business into something new, which we call the uh, digital lifestyle company. Simply by the, um, the fact that um, the consumer, as we anticipated at that time, will demand this in the future. We believe the consumer will demand from us as, a, as an operator a completely seamless experience when it comes to 
um, the, the digital lifestyle to all the products he is uh, using. He doesn't care, honestly, if it's going to be mobile or fixed. He just wants to have top-notch connection uh, to the network. He doesn't care which devices he uses. He wants to have a very easy uh, solution for all of those devices. And he doesn't want to have 15 or 20 different kind of contracts. He wants to be at best with a few providers in that direction. So the consumer behavior was changing. And uh, we could either say we take it as a, as a risk and uh, don't do anything, or we're going to move forward and uh, do this kind of experience and offer the customer a seamless experience. We're going to give the customer more than that. We give them entertainment because they want to be entertained in the future, as we can see more and more. And they want to be uh, serviced. And all this, you have to do very easy, very simple for the, um, for the end consumer. But that in itself, of course, is not the, the main purpose. I mean, the main purpose is there's a business idea behind it, yeah, as we described it, which you can see if you look at the slide at our core beliefs, I think. We, we, we believe that we have to move our business and our industry, at least in our markets, out of the price perception to the value for money perception. So instead of de defining our products by a pure price point, we define it by value for money, which by the way, it's pretty common when you go to the, um, the pay TV site. And as well, we have to be clear that uh, we don't offer one product in the future. We offer them several products. The more products we can give to the consumer, the higher the stickiness is. And that will have, and we're going to demonstrate it during the day in several presentations and in the um, digital lifestyle panel discussion, it will have a very positive impact on APU and has a very positive impact on uh, churn. Hence, that is the way forward we wanted to go as a company. And for those ones who have been there 18 months ago, you remember, we set um, pretty ambitious uh, targets. And um, maybe let me, because the targets you have seen at that time, let me explain you a bit more the motivation from my side. Why did we set those ambitious targets? I think the key point for me was that we have to demonstrate to everyone we are in the transformation of the business. We're not just optimizing something. We have really to transform the business into something new. If we just do this on a margin, in terms of uh, numbers as well, it, uh, it won't work. The second point is when you set very aggressive targets or ambitions, you get the company behind you. Everyone in the company, every employee, wherever you go in the millicom sphere knows exactly we are ambitious, we demand more, we have to go for these kind of uh, targets. So you get a much better motivation, much more speed into the organization, which is uh, important. And then the third point is um, because we knew, I knew as well, that when we came out with all these kind of changes at the same time, it was quite demanding on US investors as well. And uh, for me, it was important to, to illustrate, look, we're doing all this, but we know where we are, and those are the numbers we want to achieve, and measure us against those numbers, and measure us on the way uh, in the five-year plan against, against those uh, numbers in order to see it's real, it's not just uh, a basic idea. And that's, a ba that's the philosophy. So um, we, we, we believe, or I believe as well, we could have gone a bit easier on the targets. Uh, we could have said 8 billion in revenues, for example, instead of 9 billion. But that's not the point. We knew we had the kind of clear plan behind it. And we stretch for a bit more than we think is um, possible, which has been always a kind of culture in Millicom and uh, the group. However, at that time, which is fair, of course, uh, there were concerns. People said revenue targets uh, are ambitious. Um, but now you understand why we did it, why we were so forward leaning, and uh, why we had those kind of um, aggressive ambitions out communicated to you. So now we're in a new cycle. We did a kind of new plan. I think it's important for you as well to understand how do we come to these uh, numbers, how do we come to this strategy. It's not me sitting in my office in London with Martin Weiss, head of strategy, and some of the executive, and saying this is the number we're going to have. It's, it's a very sophisticated, structured process in the organization, bottom up. We involve the whole company. We go through every um, operation, every country, 80 people are involved, all the GMs are committed to these numbers, and all this together then creates those targets we have. So it's not top down, it's not just a, fl a fluffy ambition, it's based on business plan, strategic plans, and execution plans for all of the um, countries. So where do we stand today? One and a half year later when we executed, and um, I think most of you have already probably seen the press release. Basically, we confirmed the targets we had uh, given you 18 months ago. Um, so on the revenue side, we are confident we're going to be over $9 billion in revenues by 2017. On the EBITDA margin, we say uh, we're going to be around 35% EBITDA margin instead of we're going to be above 35% EBITDA margin. Two reasons. We can see that some of the lower EBITDA margin business are growing faster than anticipated. 
And we need a certain kind of flexibility when it comes to the integration of UNE, which uh, we talk about later, which has lower margins than um, normal cable companies, but you can increase them, obviously. But at what speed and what time is uh, to be seen. However, the other two more important points, I think, if it comes to the cash in the company, remain unchanged. CapEx to revenue targets at 15%, and OFC, OCF margin uh, at uh, 20%, which shows, if you do EBITDA minus CapEx, and come to the OCR figure, the adjustment on the EBITDA side is uh, minimal. But overall, a full confirmation of um, what we have said 18 months ago. And 18 months ago, it was an idea. It was a vision. It was a strategy. strategy. It was uh, fairly new. As we always say in Millicom, fish on the table or the, the proof in the pudding. Nowadays, of course, 18 months later, we can see a bit how have we executed towards those uh, targets and what has happened in the company on, uh, on uh, hard numbers. And you can see subscribers are starting to grow again, data penetration is up, MFS volume is up, uh, quadruple play or triple play and double play has been going up as well. But the most important point for me is that the growth is coming back to the, uh, to the company, close to 10% organic growth. And that was the, the key, key feature for us in the first one and a half years because there would have been the risk, the costs would have come anyhow by going from voice to data, for example. So if you're not going to be able to deliver growth on all the investment and the changes, we would have been in a very difficult position. So the key focus in the first one and a half years was growth and get the company back on growth as a kind of foundation. And then in the second step, and Tim will talk about this later on in his presentation as well, we're going to focus on efficiency, we're going to focus on cost. But all this, as I said, would have been nothing without bringing the growth back. Those are the numbers, and um, they are important, but if you really, and coming from, uh, from the operational side, of course, when you really want to see what kind of state is a company in and um, what is going to happen with the company, the numbers always reflect it today. They never really reflect the, the, the future to, to a true extent. I personally always measure companies by um, the kind of uh, things, what is in the innovation pipeline, how entrepreneurial is a company, how fast do they execute on uh, new products and ideas. And there has been a lot in the company, and very fast. I'm going to talk about a few. Just to illustrate, and uh, Martin Nivell talks about this later on again, we launched within five months, I think, or three months, five uh, DTH platforms in uh, Latin America, never done before. So you can see it's very entrepreneurial, it's very fast, and it's a very top execution. And two Highlights, sorry, just to illustrate you uh, what, uh, what impact it has. One of the most successful things, obviously, is, has been Tigo Music for us, which is uh, beyond just streaming. We do concert, we do a 360 approach, very different than uh, other companies in, uh, in our industry. Because I told the guys, we, we, if you do it like a telecom company, we're going to fail. So either we do it like a music company and we're going to be successful. Today, we are the largest music company in Colombia. We're actually the largest legal music company in every country. We operate Tigo Music in Latin America. We just announced today we're going to launch in Africa as well. And if you look at the ARPU increase uh, and the churn reduction, over 50% or up to 50%, it has a great value. Well, the other one we just launched a couple of weeks ago is uh, Vekesa, which is the first in, in the world automatic return of interest people have on our uh, mobile banking accounts, which is a game changer as well for the industry. For the first time, people can save money and they get a kind of return on uh, those things. So. We don't stop, we move forward, and uh, there are many future um, business to come. One of the big ones, obviously, for us as well, which we spend time today in Esteban, our GM from Colombia, here, and we talk about is uh, our integration of um, UNE, which is, uh, which is a transformational deal. Colombia will become our biggest market. Colombia is one of the most interesting markets currently in Latin America. Spending will be, is very low. And uh, with the combination of UNE, we become the second largest telecom company. But more important, we have a very strong position on data. We have a very strong position on data mobile. We have a very strong position on uh, fixed. We have a very strong position on some of the entertainment features. And by combining all those assets, um, it's going to be a very strong deal and a very strong business for us going forward. But as I said, Esteban will come uh, with a more detailed presentation. Those are the positive news. Obviously, there are always challenges in the business. Um, I've done it long enough now, over 14, 15 years as a CEO of a public as a company. It's never a straight route. There's always things coming up you have to fix in between and uh, ups and downs. Um, and we listed here a few of them. 
like on the mobile side, we have to make sure we keep the kind of correlation between data consumption and data revenues, which is, uh, is a key issue. The merger of UNE will be a kind of key feature for us uh, going forward. MFS, let me say some words about MFS, is, uh, is uh, something we have to follow up very closely as well. We had ambitious targets 18 months ago when it comes to the revenues on MFS, where we said it's going to be between 600 million and a billion dollar in uh, revenues. <laughs> Today we are a bit more cautious and say it's probably going to be by 2017 rather between 200 million and uh, 400 million. The main reason is when we when we introduced the business, we were eight months into the operation, so it was a complete startup and it was not easy to uh, to justify exactly or to to count exactly how much uh, revenues we're going to have by 2017. And with startups, you have to go through certain cycles. So, for example, we had to change some of the management. We had uh, like other ones as well, by the way, issues with the platform. That doesn't change my overall view when it comes to MFS. I still think it's a blockbuster. I still think it's going to be a big business. It's, it's not a question if, it's a question more when. And uh, again, when we talk about uh, the, the impact of those services in terms of churn, in terms of branding, in terms of customer perception, uh, it absolutely does its uh, value. But it's something we have to work on and, and, uh, and optimize. And the other thing, of course, we can't control, but they are embedded in the company as well, are uh, those four. Forex, currency is a problem. We can't do anything about it. We just can't manage through this kind of system. We can try to be more uh, focused on, on local currencies um, and so forth and so forth, but it's there. It's obviously there and has an impact on our business going forward. And uh, we have to deal with the issue once it's uh, coming. The other thing is regulatory situation, tax and legal. It had a big, big, big impact when I, when I joined Medicom. It's become a bit easier, but still, it's an issue you have to follow in Latin America or in Africa. Today, we are much better equipped internally. We have, uh, with Rachel, a person doing nothing else and dealing with uh, GR regulatory issues and uh, governmental relationships. So operationally, strategically, we are much better equipped, but it is a risk we have to, uh, to manage through. Obviously, we, uh, we work in emerging markets, and some of the markets are pretty interesting, let's put it this way, so we have to, uh, to acknowledge this issue as well. And of course, with all those kind of things we do, we have to make sure that we still stay disciplined on execution, that we stay disciplined when it comes to financial discipline, and that we hit uh, the right assets and, and set the right priorities in the company. Because sometimes, trust me, which is quite nice for a CEO, but uh, a risk as well, there are more opportunities probably than we can handle, so you have to be disciplined on what we are doing. However, those risks, are uh, again much better manageable in my point of view than 18 months ago. Why? Two reasons. First of all, our revenue streams are much more diversified nowadays. In the old days, we were depending on voice and mobile. Uh, basically, that was the kind of situation. Already today, you can see cable comes close to 30% of all revenues. Uh, it's going to grow faster. Data and, and uh, the vast services um, are at 20%. So we are much more diversified in terms of revenue streams. Regulatory impacts are not as dramatic anymore in the company as they have been before. Hence, I think we can manage the risk. And the second point as well is that we are in several countries and we are with good positions nowadays in most of the countries, either the number one or number two, except for Ghana, where we are the uh, number three. And Colombia now, after the merger, we're going to be the number two as well. So from a kind of country point of view, from a kind of uh, continent point of view, we are more diversified, <coughs> hence the risk is lower. All this I said, and all these kind of things uh, we have been presenting to you would be worthless, obviously, when it comes uh, or without a strong execution. So you can see that uh, compared to the old management team, we have changed a lot, or I have changed a lot in terms of the executive team. We recruit the top people in the industry to run our business. Like, for example, cable, we always said, is one of the most important growth areas for us in the future. Hence, we hired with uh, Martin Levert, one of the best cable person you can find in, uh, in Europe. We hired Asa Basting, for example, to revamp our African business and to move it forward. We centralized the, the, uh, the CTIO function under Xavi. And we got a new CFO as well with Tim, so, and other ones as well. So we, we really increased the quality of the team, which is, is a kind of key fundamental for me, because the business and the markets we are in are very complex. But that's just, I think, the font uh, you have. Below this, it's even more important in terms of people. We changed many, many GMs, brought very strong people in from uh, outside. We uh, recruited more MBAs, so we really take this kind of uh, management and human resources aspect very important, down to the fact that we just yesterday uh, recruited a new chief talent officer uh, for the, to the company 
She sits somewhere in the last row. Next to you, Bill, actually. She sits down there in the last row. So this is the situation. Our strategy is um, intact. It's very clear. The growth is back, which was the kind of key point for us um, as, uh, as a company. I think you can see we are very innovative. We try to do new things. We may fail with some things, but uh, all in all, I think the successes are higher than the, the, the failures. We have better people in the company. We have more better people in the company, and we can execute on all those kind of things we have uh, in the company. And we focus on profitability and uh, capital allocation after we secured that the, um, the growth is coming back. So overall, I think uh, we are in a, in, a, in a pretty good shape. I think for me as a, as a CEO now for two years, it has been, um, it has been a quite amazing journey, um, to, to be fair. And um, I wouldn't say that easy, but I can say I'm proud and I'm very happy. I'm very proud, to, to be honest, about the team, not here sitting only in the room, but as well in the countries. Because if you move an operation with, with 12,000 or even 15,000 employees into a completely new direction, normally it's a very tough exercise. And to see how fast the Tigo people in the countries have adapted uh, to the digital lifestyle idea, have executed on it and now live and breathe it is, uh, is quite outstanding and uh, gives them some credit. And I think I'm very happy as well that I can see the, the first and most important steps in executing our five-year plan are coming in place. We see key KPIs going up, we see the growth coming back, we see the brand is getting better, and uh, we see that the, the digital lifestyle strategy is not just a paper, it's, uh, it's something which is, uh, is very real. Besides that, I think in Emilicom there is one under, other thing which uh, I want to share with you at the, at the very end. So we are driven, of course, by business uh, in our markets, but we are driven as well by, by a kind of vision which is, uh, which is very important to me, to the executive team and, and the employees. And this is that we transform societies, that we transform the countries we operate in, we transform the company at the same time. You know, for many people in all markets, they never had a chance to do a banking relationship or transfer money from one place to another or even cross-border nowadays. All of a sudden, they can start to do it, they can build their own business. Or for many people, they never had the opportunity to, um, to listen to the music that they wanted to do. All of a sudden, with Tigo Music, they can have it. Down to things like, uh, we don't talk today, but again, there is a booth somewhere, I think, about it, that we offer uh, mobile education now in Rwanda. We do birth registration in, in, uh, in, in Tanzania and uh, Chad, I think, to help the government to register uh, newborns and all those kind of things. So the combination of having a great idea, a great vision, with the uh, fact that you do a good business and at the same time be part of a digital revolution is something which is quite um, rewarding. And therefore, let me finish my presentation with uh, a little movie which underlies this kind of vision. <laughs>